Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Tonight, one of the most talked about space missions of the year is going to take off from uh, launch pad 39A in Florida. This is the Inspiration 4 launch and, well, I mean, most launches don't get a Netflix a series associated with it. This is a space tourism mission and it's been one which is I don't know, very carefully crafted to avoid a number of the complaints about the other space tourism missions that have happened this year. For a start, it's actually going to orbit for three days. Sure, there is a billionaire that's paying for it, but he's been very careful to bring along some very cool, relatable, nice, regular people. And frankly, he seems pretty cool himself. But um, yeah, this is, uh, this is really exciting. This law, I mean, you know, to understand just how carefully this is planned, the launch window opens at 8.05 p.m., right? That is uh, 40 minutes after local sunset, which means the skies are getting dark and this is going to take off and it's going to rise into the sunlight and produce a very bright tail that will be visible for hundreds of miles along. There's a pretty good chance if you're anywhere on the east coast of the US that you can probably see this flying through the skies into orbit. It's taking off from Launch Complex 39A. This is the same place that Apollo launched to the moon and the space shuttle launched in its first flight. Um, it's not, uh, so it's it's not going to the, to the space station. It's actually going to a higher altitude orbit comparable to the altitude that uh, the space shuttle went to to service the Hubble Space Telescope. So this means they'll be able to see more of the world, see a view that you just can't see from the space station. Um, but, you know, one, to be clear, I've talked about this launch window, 8.05 p.m. That is the start of a five-hour launch window. That's the ideal time for them to launch if they want this twilight effect. But uh, it might be that they can't do that because they are heavily constrained by weather. This is a flight with people on board and it's not just that the launch site has to have good weather they have to have good weather all the way along their launch track because they have to have abort zones that are clear for recovery if things goes wrong so they have a lot more flexibility if the the other crew launches have a delay they pretty much have to abandon it for the entire launch window because they have to wait for the space station to come back around or the space station's orbit to come back around but this isn't going to the space station it's going into a free flying orbit so they can you know wait up to five hours for their flight to, to launch there's four people on board there's jared isaacman Haley arsenault cyan proctor and chris Sombrowski. and it's billed as the first all civilian space flight that's the sort of tagline and frankly, it's not strictly correct in many, many ways. I mean, first of all, lots of astronauts were civilians in that they had left the armed forces or never even joined the armed forces. But then you might argue that the spacecraft themselves were, you know, built by the government and therefore not civilian. You know, yeah, you can absolutely argue with the all civilian thing, but this is very clearly a different beast from previous flights. So, yeah, um... You know, to obviously build up for this, they've got a TV show that's that's running right now. They've had four episodes on Netflix, which is just covering the crew's uh, selection, their backgrounds, their uh, various exploits during training, and I'll talk a bit about that. They also had a Q and A last uh, yesterday, basically, sitting get, answering questions from the public, and this went on for a really long time. They were great. They answered more questions than both Blue Origin and Virgin Galactic put together in their pre-flight and post-flight press conferences. This was great. We got a lot of information and a lot of really good questions. And I did actually see, you know, Tim Dodd, everyday astronaut, hanging out in the backdrop and somebody asking about the environmental impact of rockets. And I could sort of see from his eyes that he was like, I know that, I know that. You know, seriously, though. Um, you know, the TV show is extraordinarily well produced it's directed i think it's the same director that did the last dance which is a fine documentary um and yeah it, it's it it just sort of lays on the feels and whatever and, and i could totally see how this works for a lot of people that aren't space nerds um yeah, I mean, this could easily have been another story about a billionaire spending a lot of money going to space. But there's a lot of, you know, like talking about fundraising. And sure, yes, he could have just spent it all on fundraising and not gone to space. But going to space is really, really cool. And I'm going to say, you know, Jared Eisen, he also he also actually has a private Air Force. So, you know, that if you really want to go on the bad side of things, yeah, you could do this. But you know, look, this is a vastly more complex endeavor 
than what um, Richard Branson or Jeff Bezos have done. This is a flight into orbit for several days. It's not something you just turn up, go through the pre-flight training and you know, fly and come back and have champagne. This has required months of training for all the crew. And you know, we've seen team building exercises where they're climbing Mount Rainier. They're flying jet planes, they're doing zero G flights. And a lot of time on the Dragon Capsule Simulator going over checklists and training so that they can handle every eventuality. They've done like 12 hour, 30 hour simulated flights starting from launch all the way to landing. And you know, when I say they're simulating everything, I'm pretty sure that this test also included the all important training of learning how to poop when the rest of your teammates are on the other side of a curtain in a room that's actually probably smaller than this one that I'm sitting in. Uh, there's also a lot of extra training for the commander and the pilot, that's uh, Jared and Cyan. And, you know, funnily, funnily enough, there's uh, you know, footage of them flying around in jet planes. And I sort of casually mentioned to an astronaut that I was talking to this weekend, and he got a bit envious when he heard that Cyan was flying a MiG-29 in training, which has a little more power than the T-38 trainers that he'd been using at NASA. <laughs> but, you know... Um, the TV show also focuses a lot on Haley, and she's a you know, childhood cancer survivor. And she can actually claim to be the first, well, she will be able to claim to be not only the youngest American in space, but uh, the first astronaut with a prosthetic, right? She uh, had, you know, she had to have a chunk of her knee removed and it's been replaced by like a piece of titanium, uh, titanium joint. And yes, yeah, she climbed up a mountain on that. That's just how effective it is. I also thought it was kind of cool that when she's flying in the back seat of the plane, she, you hear her just saying, so I want you to pull as many G's as possible. And you know, you, you get some nice shots of her, like just the skin pulling off her face at like 8G, but she's like, great, my prosthetic works at 8G. I'm gonna have to tell my surgeon, you know, the new data point. And, and, and by the way, yeah, also Chris, yeah, no disrespect to him, but if they ever do make like a, a movie adaptation, I think this character would be the comic relief. I mean, you've got the commander, the pilot, the medical officer, and Chris. <laughs> you know, he had severe motion sickness in the centrifuge and all that, but like, I'm under no illusions. He's a space geek. He's a space nerd like me and many of you. He is living the dream. He works in aerospace and he's loving it. This is fantastic. Um, but yeah, I think the other three crew members are clearly the ones that are getting more, more airtime, although he seems to be good at answering some of the questions. Now, in terms of the mission hardware, it's pretty much a regular Dragon spacecraft. There's, there's no real major modifications to it to make it a tourism version, except the docking adapter. So it's not going to the space station, right? It's going on this free flight, which means it doesn't need a docking system. So they've replaced that with uh, an observation dome, which is, I believe, will be the largest single window ever flown on a spacecraft. And it, it's amazing that this was apparently put together in six months. It started out as a sort of rough idea. It was fleshed out very quickly into a design, built, tested, and fit, you know, fitted. I think the dome, so that it has two layers of, it's plexiglass, I believe, or acrylic, right? And I'm pretty sure they could just go to an aquarium supplier, like a, you know, a, an industrial scale aquarium supplier and buy these things pre-made. So they probably, like, this is probably the same hardware that you'll find at, like, your local, your big scale aquarium. Obviously, they have to like create different kinds of seals. And yeah, aquariums have to handle higher pressures as well. But, um, you know, plexiglass isn't exactly a, a high-tech material anymore. They've, they've been using it in planes since World War II. Uh, but, I mean, to be clear, it is a type of plastic and it's not going to be able to handle re-entry. So they have the nose cone that folds over it. And on the inside, there's a hatch. Now, I know there's a... Um, if the nose cone doesn't close properly on the dragon, they have a way to eject the nose cone. So in that situation, you need the hatch on the inside as well because that dome won't survive the, the heat of that. Apparently the nose cone, as it folds up as well, there's gonna be a camera on the inside that looks out. So they'll have views of the people like looking at the earth and viewing things. Yeah, it's uh, that that's gonna be pretty amazing. And I hope somebody brings a 360 camera because that would be pretty darn neat. 
they're they're bringing along some other stuff. They've got like some hops for making beer, and I know that the I know that Jared was trying to find some brewers who would be interested in making a substantial donation to St. Jude in exchange for getting these hops so that they could make some space beer. And uh, I'm willing to test that space beer, by the way, who, um, yeah, Sam Adams, right? Uh, they're doing, they're doing so, some small amounts of medical tests. So a lot of this is going to be testing, funnily enough, it's going to be testing a lot of stuff with like Apple watches and they're going to have like ultrasound gear to look at fluid redistribution and I believe it's the butterfly ultrasound system which literally plugs into an iPhone or an iPad so like yeah this is this is a whole bunch of people just going up to space with their cell phones I'm pretty sure <laughs> they will be tweeting for everything up there so look this is this is actually pretty pretty fantastic on many levels and I should also point out that Axiom this really has managed to steal the thunder somewhat from Axiom who for a while had been advertising that they were going to have the first space mission, uh, first private tourism space mission on a SpaceX spacecraft. But the thing was, they're going to the space station, so they were very much constrained by when they could actually get docking time, you know, and park on the space station. And they are, obviously, uh, that's now pushed them into second place, whereas this was able to fly free and do what it wanted. So they've somewhat lost that. And, and frankly, while the crew, again, is full of amazing people, they're not going to have this cool Netflix documentary. And all of these people are, are investors that have managed to make you know bucket loads of money doing, you know, accounting type things in stock markets, as opposed to, you know, everyday people that want to be science educators or uh, physicians or build planes or run your own private air force. Uh, also... When this gets to space tonight, this will probably be, unless China brings their space, their people home very quickly, this will be a record for the most people in space simultaneously. There will be 14 people, right? Um, four on a dragon, on, the, on Inspiration4, four, four who are on the ISS from a dragon. There's going to be three from a Soyuz and three from the, the Shenzhou. So that'll be a record for most people in orbit, although technically there were 16 when Virgin Galactic popped above their uh, out their arbitrary limit, and you know New Shepard also got fourteen, but again that was just a very short flight. And it'll also be the first time we have three Dragon spacecraft in space, which you know I guess that's cool for SpaceX. Yeah, this is a I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. I, I'm really glad that I've uh, I've had a lot of random people just ask me about this that aren't necessarily into space. They've heard about this story and it's sort of relating to them. And, and I did spend the weekend hiking into Meteor Crater and, and meeting with people that, uh, you know, knew a lot about space. I actually was was talking to Anusha Ansari, who, of course, she does a lot of X-Prize stuff, but she was uh, the first female space tourist and, and he, she seems quite excited by the whole thing as well. So anyway, uh, looking forward to this. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>